Alright, gear day ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the Unprofessionals podcast number one. Yes, we are finally going to do this and we're starting off with PAX 2019 because obviously it is the big event in Australian gaming this year. So before we get too far into it, we're going to do a quick breakdown of exactly how the podcast is going to work. Uh, We're going to soft cap this at about an hour um, if we head out towards an hour and a half. We will, if we've uh, got stuff to talk about. I don't want this to have uh, to be a podcast that's set at like two hours and then on any given week that we don't actually have much to talk about, we just waffle on. Uh, the podcast is going to be roughly, well, it's fortnightly at this point. We are hoping to do it weekly in the long run. And uh, me and Dead Meat will be the ones on here, and we're hoping we can have a few guests rotate through as time happens as well. And most importantly... It'll be unprofessional. Yes, it will be very unprofessional. So expect all sorts of horrible mess-ups to happen all the goddamn time. I'm probably going to dox myself at some time because, you know, I'm running this, so it's going to go wrong. Anyways, um, that's really it. Anything else? No, no, that's that's about it. To just sit back, have a, have a listen. We'll have a few videos on this one, but we may not have videos every week, so... Yeah. So, yep, for this one. So, want to get into the 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 main main topic here for the night, which is the general impressions of the event. Yes. Um. So, for those of you who don't know, PAX is a, is a is originally the Penny Arcade Expo, um, based for the Penny Arcade Comics, and then they started their own. Um. I guess it's a, 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 convention. a, a game, games convention. And... It's uh, long-term turned into pretty much Australia's biggest gaming convention overall, although I think it's probably fair to say it's one of our only as well. Nothing else down this end of the world, but it is pretty large down here. This year, 80,000 people on the floor over the event, which is uh, 20,000 up from our last year at 60,000. It was absolutely packed. The Friday event was the Friday event felt like any other Saturday that we've been down here and we've been doing this for four years. It was shoulder to shoulder. And today, well, today I'm thankful we actually had quite a number of things to do so we didn't spend a huge amount of time on the floor because it was kind of nuts. The um, the Friday we had the luck of being able to get through the doors a little bit early so we were able to slip through and see a couple of things before the great unwashed masses made the floor. Um, and able to watch them through from the other side, but we had to join them on the entry for the way in today. Just to give you an idea how many people went through the door, the Nintendo stand had obviously the new Pokemon running. Um, Within the time it took us, and we were the fourth row that was entered uh, entered into the event, which probably took about maybe three minutes for our row to move into the event. The people that had managed to get through the door ahead of us hit the Nintendo stand and had wrapped a queue twice around this stand, lining up to play a game of goddamn Pokemon. And that that stand is 50 metres long and about 40 metres wide. There was a... Uh, it, it, it made me... The, there was a, my, 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 my hope for, the, for humanity was <laughs> lost seeing how many people were lining up. There was at least a couple of hundred people within two to three minutes of the event starting lined up, and that did not reduce all day. I don't know if that was people that were just cycling through to get another crack at it or whether or not it was just a giant, unending stream of people wanting to get into the Nintendo booth. But Nintendo does put on a pretty good show overall, so it's um, it's not overly surprising. The event runs over three days. We're um, only going to be down for the two. We were going to stay for the third day, but quite frankly, we're knackered, so we're just going to go home. We're going to pull out. It's just it's been a, a long few days. We've had uh, interviews with Nvidia, Wacom. We've we've seen a whole heap of new games. We'll get to later on. We we, we sat down with a, oh, a private session with Nvidia with a few other uh, media and content creators which we'll also get to later on. We got to have a, a good look through um, what watch the, a live, game. live gameplay demonstration of Cyberpunk 2077. Yes, that was um, fun. As well as we actually got to sit down and view. Uh, the... Yeah, John, um, 
and my brain is stopped functioning and I don't have his name directly in front of me at the moment. One of the lead game directors for CD Projekt Red. Uh, I will. Um, he, he's, he's worked on all three Witcher games as well as Punk 27. It was quite interesting, um, interesting talk and he, he looked as tired as we felt. <laughs> It looks as tired as we sound right now. I am pulling up the name right now because it's sad that I did not have this up already, but as I said, um, unprofessionals. But anyways, we got to sit down with him for what was supposed to be a half-hour interview, and we were there for... No, no, it was supposed to be about a 20-minute interview. Well, we were there for nearly 40 minutes, so we ran way over. But um, yeah, we had a good chat, and I got a couple of questions in there. So I will be going over a a brief coverage of the, um, the questions we got to ask. I'm going to... Uh, obviously be doing a video on that as well so and there's a couple of things i need clarity on um i couldn't get 100 percent answers on a lot of my questions but i have been asked to shoot them through in an email and i will get a response back because obviously a game that's still in development and a game that is this large there are there are things that are discussed that can't really be announced in public just yet or are not ready for public unveiling just yet. And some of these, we were dodging on the edge of some of these topics. So, okay. But yeah. we'll, we'll get into more of that later. Gen- generally, for, for those that haven't been to PAX or even a convention, basically, there's three main sections of the event. There's, there's the show floor, which has all your stands, friend, your... your Xbox stand, your HP Omen stand, your you know Republic of Gamers stand, your Nintendo stand, your your Sony PlayStation Four stand, things like that. All, all of the kind of things you'll see lots of pictures of. Then there's a a, a Collectible. collectibles and board gaming section, which has all like stalls oh. board games like like that. PAX has a massive focus on um, board gaming and traditional gaming, so they've actually got a really large section down the back with uh, the likes of your war, not so much your Warhammer type stuff, um, which is unfortunate. I'd love if there was, but a lot of your traditional um, Magic the Gathering, yeah, and other war gaming titles, as well as some just some straight up traditional board games. It is completely common to go down the back section of Patch, uh, PAX, and find eight people that may have only met one another that day, fighting over a game of Monopoly and screaming at one another. Fantastic. Definitely worth going down the end. Yeah. Also in that section, there, there's there's a, a retro gaming and, and arcade oh, and section, old. section old. which which has all, all of the sort of retro gamings. They usually have a a, dis, a, a display set up for cert, certain topics. The year they had um, a Commodore Amiga set up with, uh, I think it's an Amiga 1000 with all all of the attachments okay. show, showing a, a, a video playing actually on like real time video playing on the Amiga how, how in software that they use back in the day. And if you ever have so, the opportunity to go to a PAX and you happen to be about my age, be prepared to feel very, very, very old walking past these glass cabinets like you would find in a museum full of you know the relics of gaming history and I'm looking in them and going I owned that, I owned that, I owned that, I owned that, I own I still own all of these. It's um it's a very quick reminder on the fact that we're getting bloody old. On outside of that, there's also a a gaming section. So there's a console gaming section where you, you can go in, you can sign up and you can join in tournaments or just for, uh, free, free play. There, there's also a free play PC area where there's a whole heap of PCs set up there, um, and you just sign up and you go sit down, and you play multiplayer games. With there's also a bring your own computer um, section, which they actually this year moved into a completely different section of the convention center. Um, outside, so there's there's those two sections. Then the third section, the theater section, which has all of the the theatre type of uh, the cyberpunk uh, 2077 live play was in there. Um, yeah. Although they sort of needed that because I'm pretty sure we emptied out half the convention center the second that show started. God, there was a lot of people in there and a lot of lineups. It, it, it the the room was packed and it was packed for the first session. And I believe it'll pack, packed for the session. Sorry. Um, and then there's things like there's after after the event. The well, the show floor closes at six p.m. 
after the um, after that's closed, there are further things happening in in those theatres. Um, one of which is a a uh, an orchestra concert. Mm. So, so that this one was focusing on Mega Man. Um, I did have illusions that I might want to actually go to that, and then I realised that by the end of the day, I'm not going to have the energy to. Do it. Yeah, after, after I would have, I would have fallen asleep. It's not... After two days, yeah. Um, so, anyways, that's the breakdown of exactly how PAX runs, and there is there's a lot there. Um, in truth, we probably didn't see everything that we could have seen. But this is mainly because there were some things we just had to limit ourselves on, um, and some areas that I don't usually actively look closely at because it's not usually something that's related to the channel. Although I am sort of planning on over the next months expanding the channel quite a lot. So I think the next packs I'll be taking a much closer look at the Nintendo stand if I can fight the great wash masses, uh, masses to actually get in there. Um, I don't know if they were all that washed. <laughs> battle my way into the um, battle my way into the uh, PlayStation Four booth and actually see what is going on in there. Some of the stuff, uh, some of the setups are actually quite elaborate and quite a lot. Going on. But anyways, of the topics and stuff that we did see, moving on to the first one was Wacom. Now this one is something that was more for me. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Wacom, Wacom is a tech peripheral developer specifically works in drawing and graphics tablets. So these tablets are essentially a way for you, for an artist or a designer to be able to draw directly onto the computer. I got an invitation to go down and speak to them, and obviously I'm in the middle of a graphics design degree at the moment, so there was no way I was not going to go and check them out. And they were there to display... Well, just display the tablets and their gear, of course, but the reason for them being there was the tools of the designer that actually you know, works in the gaming industry. What do they actually use to do their technical designs? What do they use to do their concepts? What do they use to actually create the characters that you see within the game? And Wacom is basically the industry standard. They have some of the best equipment on the market, some of the best drawing tablets, some of the best design peripherals. And they were showing off a whole new section of tech while we were there. Now I'm going to try and fight here to actually get a bit of a video up to give you a little bit of a look at what was going on, if I can find the right video, so you'll have to bear just, with me. Um, just, while, just while Mags is trying to sort that out, I'll sort of give a, a bit of an overview of what I, what I was like that booth. Obviously not being of the creative um, type myself, I, I was focused on trying to work out what would be cool to, to, to video camera. I found was that they were actually doing a professional 3D modeling via with, with a T5 Pro. So they they were actually sketching out the the outline of what they intended to build in in 3D, and then they started actually creating the 3D model in 3D, just in the hand controllers to. I put it together. You'll you'll see more of it once once Max yeah, puts yeah. his video together. But it some of the stuff there was it was just so really really interesting. This to is just happened. a bit of an overshot of the shoulder video of me just working on one of the tablets. This is one of their Syntex 32s, which is actually something that I'm looking at getting myself. It's about the right size for me. But you can see I'm using a pen to just draw directly. Oh, that's, not, you. that's not you. Oh no, uh, that's that, the other guy. So that's, that's the other the one. Other that's the other. All right, guy. so just directly or oh, the other guy. Got myself mixed up. That's that shows that's I'm tired. That's Leave me alone. That was an artist. He said he was he was there. He was working over the whole three days to try finish that that piece that he worked. Yeah. So you can see he's drawing directly onto the tablet itself. So no other interfaces. The pen can interact directly with the screen, and it works. the The surface is coated with a um. It's almost an etched glass. The Etching is designed to give the feel and feedback that an artist would have working on paper. So they get the same feeling through the pen as they would on a traditional medium, despite the fact that they're working completely digitally. And the tablet itself can display pretty much any drawing program that they would prefer. So it works with a touch of everything. All right, I'll get one, this one. One, 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 things, one about that one before you move off that video. Yep. Um, now that, that guy, he is resting his palm on that screen. It has fantastic palm rejection. So, with EG, it ignores. Hmm. Um, 
but it is still touch capable. So if he puts his fingerprints on uh, fingertips on it, he can zoom and manipulate the image just by pushing it around the screen. But resting his palm or his arm against the screen won't actually. So there was that side, and that eventually, and I'm getting a bit of coverage and crap going on here. As I said, I'm likely going to dox myself, so I'll quickly flip that off for a second while I find the second video. Um. Find it. Nope, that is not the right one. So I have not had a chance to fully sort everything that's here just yet. Yeah, totally. Yep. Okay, this is using the H. The same artist using the HTC Vive and using a Wacom. No, it was a different artist. Different artist. I'm glad, yeah, I'm glad you're paying attention. I was too busy working with the tablets. <laughs> Another artist working with the HTC Vive and a set of Wacom software. He's putting up the image that was drawn before. That's been put up on display. And selecting his brushes and everything else here. What you'll see, he'll straight up just start designing it in 3D and begin moving the, um, moving the image and the lines around. Now, I don't think we actually caught it, but he ended up using another brush once this was done a bit later, once he'd done all the line work for the image to work out the exact 3D shape that it was going to be at. Okay, I, I see something now that that I I did see before, yep. and I was actually recording it. So one one of the things you mentioned that that he drawn it on another thing. All I'd seen was him doing the drawing that he's doing now. Yeah. So you can see he's actually sketching out the outline yep. of the of the parts. Yeah. But I didn't realize he'd actually drawn that on another thing. And yeah, just transferred it over. Part. Yeah, that was just put up on the wall as just a. Uh, you like do it all the reference. time, it's just a reference, so he knew what he was working with. And he ends up using a brush here later, and I, unfortunately I don't think we managed to catch it. But he started I filling in the blocks, did, and it looked almost like he was sculpting clay in VR until he actually created the full model in essentially a, a base grey in 3D, ready to rock and roll. An animator could have walked straight in and started connecting up the limbs and making it all work and move. Um, and all it needed would have been a texture and a lighting pass. I was asking a bit about this, why, um, why he was doing the work. It's not just his ability to draw in 3D and VR using this. He can completely manipulate the lighting in the setting. So once he's actually filled in the 3D model, so it's beyond being line work, he can actually change the lighting for single point to make sure the shadows on the 3D model that he's created are actually throwing correctly. And he can dynamically change the light, mix the lighting color, play around with it in whatever way he needs to, just to make sure the model is 100% functional before a texture artist goes to it. And he should be able to spray paint the model and actually create the textures themselves fully in 3D as well without actually needing to take it out to another program. So, yeah, it was, um, I, I've never seen anything quite like it before, but this is apparently starting to get taken up by quite a lot of design studios in the gaming industry, and this is how they're starting to build some of their 3D models, because he did in, we were there for what, 15, 20 minutes, maybe half an hour? Half an hour. Half an hour, and he went from a sketch, which we showed earlier on, on a 2D image, to essentially a reference built 3D model inside of you know inside of that time frame inside of 30 minutes tops completely built in VR so yeah that was um you know, to 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 be specific it, it wasn't the the 3D model drew wasn't textured just the uh, Basically gray blocks. Yeah, it was just gray blocks, but it could have been textured straight away after that. That was just completion. It was ready for basically animation rigging and texturing at that point and could have been taken further if he wanted to. In fact, he probably did after we left. Yeah. Um, actually, have to, thinking about now, that may have been the same artist. I thought it was. Sure. I thought it was. I, I, I wasn't sure. May, may have been. I was pretty sure because I actually I think I do actually it's, it's, it's have the business blur. card for the artist here. I think they only had the one on. But um, yeah, anyways, it's that all it's all a blur to me at the moment. Yes, all of an event. But yeah, anyways, that was um, that was our trip down to Wacom. I've got a little bit more that I want to cover on that in the future. But um, it was impressive to actually see all that in action. 
And I, I don't, I didn't ask how much that kind of a setup and that software would have actually cost. I know how much the, the Vive Pro costs. Yep, that's your starting it's point. Eighteen hundred dollars Australian. Yep. Um, and then add in the software. Yeah, add in the software. Don't know, don't know how much software is. Yeah, whack the um the Syntec Pro, which I think is close to another six on top of that. It's um it's not cheap, but this is this is your industry standard stuff. So this is um what the likes of uh you know Pixar is probably already using. I know they're using Wacom tablets as the basis for all their design now. Um, so they're probably doing the 3D sculpting in VR now as well, and there will be other gaming studios that are already picking it up on top of that. So, yeah, that was a and a very interesting start to the Saturday morning and something that I had never seen and didn't even think was a possibility. So moving up from there... Well, we spent a bit of time in the indie section. Um, a whole heap of indie developers have a little sort of Sort of basically a shelf on a on a booth, um, either side, and they. Uh, well, how many would there be? Uh, there's probably fifty, a hundred little indie stands. The indie section at PAX is mainly focused around independent developers from across Australia. So, so some of the stuff you've already se- you may have already seen on Mag's channel. Yeah. That that what was that flying game where you deliver take deliveries around? Uh, the helicopter flights in one, the one that the patch broke. Uh, broke your save? Uh, I don't remember the name. Yeah, my it. brain's busted. At the moment. Um. Anyways, the um. The, the, there's that. There was. Uh, I don't know. You do you do a video on twenty two racing series? Oh uh, no, we only covered twenty two racing series stream. Although I'm probably going to do a video on it now because it's a little bit more yeah. advanced. Uh, twenty two racing series is. Uh, what would you describe it as? It was almost like a um old wipeout three oh. D type. Oh, yeah, I'd say may, maybe Wipeout mixed with maybe F Zero, yep. maybe a little bit of of Track Mania Nation thrown in. It's it's, it's a a competitive racing game yeah. where the faster you go, the harder you track. Yeah, it's it models real physics despite looking like an arcade game, but it's playing through the kind of fantasy race tracks you would normally find in pure arcade, you know, almost flight races. So large circular tunnels with massive sections of broken, but because physics is actually modelled, you have to sort of go with the flow of the tunnels. And if you hit them in the right way, physics will happen, and your car will be thrown into the next section of the tunnel as it would and should land as it should. If you go the wrong way, physics will also happen, and you'll go for a big long ride out into the middle of nowhere and crash and die horribly. Um, played at you know three hundred kilometres an hour, type thing. Very, very brightly coloured game. Lots of AMD Radeon logos everywhere, and very, very, very highly branded on their very game. It's it's quite an interesting little title. That Mike said it. We're gonna it's gonna cover yeah, it later on. I'm definitely going to do a little bit of an indie showcase. That one's one I've actually already got on Steam, and the. The same version that we saw at PAX um, should be updated to it. It's still in development at this point. Most of these, most of the titles in the indie section are in development titles rather than being completed titles. And um, but yeah, I've actually got a copy of it that I can demonstrate. So I'm going to throw some live footage of me playing it. It's the same patch, but a slightly different branch. The version they were showing at PAX because they have the ability to throw gaming logos and um, peripheral logos, so Logitech logos yeah, they, or whatever they, else. They, 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 stuck, they had they PAX stuck, logos. They, stuck PAX they logos had dr- everywhere in it. PAX logos glowing in neon across everything because PAX and just demonstrating that they have the ability to do that. Their long-term goal for it is actually to create what is essentially a tournament eSport racer is sort of what they're going for, to team-based racing um, for, for, for eSport at high speeds bright colours, something that will be really interesting to watch and a hell of a lot of fun while still being challenging. And I think they're going to do a pretty good job of it. Like, it looks pretty great. Yeah, it's pretty well. Speaking of, of games that are uh, uh, the releasing of, of games there, one game that actually has actually made it through, we, we saw it earlier early on when it was early in development. Yes. It's actually now, just in the last week or so, actually released um, a game called Heist, yep. which 
which Mags has had on the channel yep. earlier. I'll pop a little bit of that up for us right now in the background. This is me playing. I'll see if I can find a more interesting section. Heist is... It's a noir game. You are a thief. Sneaky, sneaky. You're a thief, and you have objectives to steal things, obviously. In this case, uh, this demo send mission... It towards the end of it, yep. I've got to focus directly on the actual screen. Ah, of course. Um, all right, so... The whole game is done in this almost black and white, extremely low color aesthetic, as you can see. Sorry about having a little bit of the um, the glare off the screen. It, it's sh very difficult to to get any camera shots where the screens weren't sort of yeah. all shiny. Because yeah, and then the whole color palette is not particularly great for this kind of recording. But anyways, the entire game is working in the shadows, trying not to be detected. So you can throw coins at walls in order to create a noise to try and distract a guard while you're slipping. Shadows. If you need a larger distraction, you might be able to place some remote cherry bombs that will explode and make a lot of noise, attracting a lot of guards into one area that might allow you to fast. You can hide in various parts of the environment and cover the fact that you're there. Standing in open light will get you spotted. You can sprint, but you create a lot of noise, and that noise will alert all of the nearby guards instantly to your exact location. So the entire game is focused around this whole not, the whole stealth mechanic, not being detected, manipulating your environment, and using one of three items that you can take into any particular level in order to manipulate the guards. Um, there are traps you can set. I'm about to set a tripwire here. So I'm going to walk out into the light. I'm going to get seen by a guard at the end of the corridor. Actually, this one here, I think I messed up and get taken down. If the guards get you, you instantly fail and you have to play through the section again. So if I go a little bit further up... No, no, let, yep. let the people fail. Yep. Well, no, you see me fail, and then I just go through the exact same thing, thing again, is. so I'm picking safe all over again. The save system for it, the autosave system, could be a little improved, but then again, it's punishing. It's not so punishing as to really cause your problems. There we go, placing a tripwire. Guard goes over, and I walk up, and you can see the shocks off the sound as I get up to the next section. Place another one just in case he's following me, and then head towards the exit to complete the mission. So it's, it's a purely stealth-based game. You do not have any combat abilities. If you are detected, your options are to run away and hope they don't catch you. Get lure them into a trap, which are always non-lethal. It's a tripwire, or it's a, something that'll stun them, something along those lines. Or get caught and have to go through the entire thing again. So the, the trick focus for the game is to just not get detected at any point. Um, if you do, you, you basically lose. And I, there's a rather large shortage of games of this kind of genre and pure stealth games these days. And this is a pretty good one for a third-person game, and it works as a pretty good puzzler overall. Um, so it's made completely in Melbourne. Um, we saw that at PAX the first time two years ago. Um, I did a little bit of stream coverage, and I think I had it on a one of my early PAX videos from two years ago as well. I don't recall them being there last year, but they went into full release two weeks ago. Uh, two weeks? A week or two ago. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly when. I'm, but I got a message saying that my key was deactivated. Yeah. So. so, yeah, two weeks ago went into full release. So they're now on the market. So they were one of the few games in the indie section for, um, for PAX Oz that actually had a release game. And it's, it's a bloody good game. You should probably check that one out. The other one... <laughs> Oh, this, this, this. Oh, got some, got some juices flowing. Yeah, I, I fangirled pick, just pick, a little. Pick, picture, picture yourself. You're, you're a nostalgia gamer. You're older. You, you played a game called Fallout. Uh, specifically, probably close to Fallout Two. Um, so, so not, not three D. An isometric yeah. view, top down view. Yeah, let me find the video. <laughs> so now, this, this is gonna. Going to tinge a few of the older players that have, um, a few of the older players, uh, fancy. It's a, it's a isometric post apocalypse, um, uh, Fallout style game. Um, but it's got a bit of a twist. The entire game is based in Australia. As you can see at the bottom of the screen there, which this was recorded while I was talking with the lead dev, that is a VE Commodore Ute. 
that is um, just one of the wrecks you'll find around the wasteland. The entire game is built under the same principles as the original Fallouts were. The Wasteland is just based in Australia rather than being in the Fallout universe. And one of the major things they've done is they have not defined what caused the apocalypse. Um, it is something that you can potentially discover in your playthrough, but it's also something that's not actually directly linked to your playthrough. As in, this, the storyline does not revolve around the events that led to the apocalypse. The story in, is involved in what the hell are you going to do now that there is an apocalypse and you are trying to survive through it. The core part of the story will be building and linking towns together uh, via radio towers, which sounds a bit bethesda -y. I heard it when I heard it in the first place, but... Mechanically, it makes sense. You, you uncover and encounter new people on in the world. Some of the people that you are you have as companions or that you're working with don't want to lose contact with those that they've managed to found and the small section of civilization that they've managed to create. So your a big part of your ability of moving the map is repairing or building these radio towers and getting them functional so you can maintain a line of communication from basically from your starting area all the way up to where you potentially are. The world itself is, and keep in mind everything you're seeing here, this is six months active development. The game is not planned for release until 2021. Very early on at this point. The game itself is um, going to have a play area equivalent in size roughly to what Fallout 2 had. Those of you who played it will remember it was actually quite a large play area. Um, the the artwork and the level design itself, it looks like a 2D painting, and it sort of is. They actually got one of the artists from the more recent Shadowrun games to get involved because they really like the aesthetic, but it is actually 3D. The camera position is fixed, but everything within the world is actually a 3D item that has had a 2D painting placed across the top of it. So the trees there, as he was actually pointing out to me then, the trees there are actually a 3D shape that's created within the environment that a 2D painting is applied over. So you can walk under sections of the terrain, you can walk inside of sections of the terrain, even though they only look like a painting, and all the shadows are accurately thrown and will change as the time of day changes. The other part that was really interesting about it was the morality system. I'll try and bring up and get a little bit closer, and I won't go into it too much here, but essentially what they've done is they've separated the skill trees and the morality system into two completely different areas. The skill trees define your build, and they are fairly open on what you want to do. It's basically a combat tree, a stealth tree, a stealth type tree, and a science type tree, which you're probably familiar with with most RPGs. But the trick comes in the morality system which is essentially a moral compass. When you start the game, depending on what your first decisions are in the at the very earliest point in the game, your moral compass will select a direction based on what choices you made. You know, did you choose to kill somebody? Did you choose to save them? Did you choose to just ignore them? What did you do? And that gives your moral compass a direction. Now, if you do different things during the event, you can see over here on the left-hand side, every event that you do within the game, every conversation you have, every choice you make is recorded, and they all have different values. These won't chain, instantly change the direction that the compass is actually pointing in, but as you make these choices, the compass will swing in the direction that you're moving. Now, if you keep going down one particular path... This compass, instead of being sort of a 45 degree arc, will narrow and you'll progress further down until it's very thin following one particular mark. And as you can see, there are actually special skills that are related to your morality or abilities that you can unlock. But to get access to them, you have to focus down one path or to follow one morality. And if you shift away from them, even if you have one selected, you will lose them because your morality has shifted away and you don't get them back. So, well, you don't get them back unless you make choices that swing the moral compass back in the other direction. So this is the skill tree here, and you can see you've got... Uh, uh, it's Fortitude, Temperance, and Wisdom is the three. And your four things are um, Machiavellian, uh, Utilitarian... Uh, I can't read the other two from here, but um, they're all based... So, hmm? 
not that's not too much of an issue because yeah. you'll you'll cover yeah I'll cover it more when I do the video. But yeah. this whole section of the game was really interesting because. Not only is this a really cool little Fallout survival game isometric, which is cool on its own, with turn-based combat. It's got turn-based combat just like the original Fallout. But this is a kind of moral system that I've never seen. Like, if you look at something like, say, um, some of the other games that are out, you tend to, I'm going to be good this choice, and then I'm going to be the worst asshole in the world in the next choice. Well, in this system, you won't have that option. The only options available to you in combat will relate directly through to your moral compass, and your moral compass is pointed by the decisions you've actually made. Turning the compass will require you to talk on the edges of it and actually shift the compass off the centre that it's at. It's just, it's just a really interesting little mechanic overall. So, speaking of direction... Kangaroo bouncing around in the background? Well, there's that, and there's the, the the directions of lights bouncing. It lead into our next ah one. yes, 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 yeah, yes. All right, so let's drop this. We one we, down. we had some time. We we got to spend some time with quality time with India. I don't think they liked. Me. <laughs> I I think I I I put one of them on the back foot myself just quietly. Yeah. So we we went we went in there. They they gave us a uh, that it was like. Five or six of us in a session, yeah, three, three or four Nvidia employees. Um, they they gave us a, a spiel about what RTX is, what ray tracing is, and and you know where where Nvidia things are heading. The the usual spiel that you've seen Nvidia spit out multiple times trying to sell their RTX cards. Um, you know, not, not nothing that I'm gonna sort of cover and bore you with. I'll, Mags will obviously. Go over it. Get the, get the slideshow from them. So we'll have to make sure we get that slideshow. Yeah, I'll shoot through. It was only really yeah. a description of exactly how ray tracing works, which... Yeah. Which is... It's it's actually probably a good thing for you to put on on your, your YouTube channel. Now, fairly standard. I, I did sort of make a comment that I, I'd spent grand train on a RTX card for a small upgrade, which made him Wince. Wince a little <laughs> bit and and yeah, he's he's just oh, you know, you could have gotten gotten a, a, a twenty eighty and and you know I I pointed out that that wouldn't have given great impact. and and you know, his his counter that to that was yeah, but you'd get RTX and I I pointed out that none of the main games I play actually support it. And then he, he wandered away looking annoyed with <laughs> Um, um, just a quick response in here for uh, Arctic. Uh, we'll, we'll try keep the response until the yeah. end of the. I'll podcast. just drop drop this one in. It's um, it's in regards to it. In order to shift far enough off your class, you'd need to keep making the same decisions in one direction over and over and over again to actually turn it through. It's not going to be a make one decision and that's it. Everything all happens. You'll have warning ahead of time. So if you lose your ability. Well, you knew it was coming, and you kept choosing to lose your ability anyway. So. It's, it's it's not a hard you make this yeah. once or twice, and it's bam, you're, yeah. you're penalised. It's it's a slow sort of build up yeah. kind of thing. It'll it'll make more sense once once we yeah once I once I cover once, it once, like once he gets the video up. Um, I don't yeah. really want to to get. Back onto that. Yeah, we'll jump back onto Minecraft. I'm getting that, that, that up that's now. A, that's a topic for a, a video. So yeah, a couple, what they did after we had the the India spiel, we we got sat down with uh, the the room was surrounded by computers. Um, on one side we had video editing type stuff, which I'll I'll let Mags waffle about because he talked about that. I was talking to the others about the game side of things. Um, the uh, on the other side there was a row of computers running RTX Minecraft, um, and then outside of that there was uh, the Wolfenstein New Blood. Yeah, the RTX uh, version um, of Wolfenstein New Blood, which had the RTX patch not released yeah, yet. Yeah, we weren't allowed to record that one either, and um, yeah, I suspect I know why. It, it, it crashed. Yeah, it crashed. Um, 
It was very uh, pretty. Ma- Mags made it crash. I didn't. I didn't. It ran perfectly. Yeah, it had fine. to be me that made it crash. Of course. Yeah. Um, then they had another game there which we didn't end up actually even looking at. Um, they they talked about the uh, game yeah, Pro, which is apparently the only game that implements the three sort of features of the RTX, so the reflection, shadows, and light. Yeah, global lighting. Global lighting. Um, whereas others only met one or maybe two of these things. Um, the the main main event basically was Minecraft, which you're seeing footage of, of Mags playing through Minecraft. Um, this is the map that if you've seen the RTX demonstration for Minecraft, this is the map that they actually demonstrate on. So we actually got to play around on it, have a have a look ourselves and and properly well I, I, I just went and tried to look for cool they didn't show in the their demonstration video. You know? I Man, tried to break the world. Because of course yeah. I did. They build this wonderful little house with all of the beautiful examples of how the RTX lighting works and the first thing I went and did is smash holes in everything that I could find trying to break it. So they had it set up so that we could actually switch back and forth. Yeah, between, you'll between see some R- of that here. RTX yeah. and non-RTX. Um, he's breaking into somewhere where he should. Yeah, just... So he, here's, here's the house that they show yeah. you and all the fancy That's what it looks like without the fancy lighting. So that's what traditional Minecraft would look like in this house. And what the traditional fireplace that's down there, and that's it on. And the the trick with the RTX is actually mostly up here on the colors. Like obviously, water looks like water yeah, reflects light, but where the colors are blending and morphing together, and how the glows and the shadows are actually working, it's it is pretty pretty. I I still don't. I it's pretty, and it's going to be fun to play if you happen to have an RTX card. And as a demonstration piece for what RTX is actually capable of doing, and yeah, this is my thing. Um, I decided I'd just burrow underneath the house and I found more stuff. Um, if you happen to have an RTX card and you want to play Minecraft, this is probably going to be the best way to do it. And it's going to look absolutely gorgeous. Now, uh, another thing I'll point out is that they actually had two different versions of RTX Minecraft. There was one made by Microsoft, Mojang. Um, I'm not sure which of the two. It might have been just the DirectX team that's pushing their DXR and one that was made by NVIDIA. NVIDIA added extra textures. So the one that you're seeing here is the one that that NVIDIA made. Yeah. It has extra textures, which adds, adds certain effects, yeah. which you'll see a little bit later on in the video. Um, yeah, the, um, uh, the, the crux of what I was getting at is the reason why Minecraft became popular is because basically it could run on anything. It's kind of like the same reason that um, most of the wargaming titles and War Thunder is relatively popular. You can run them on a potato, and you can have a lot of fun doing it. To get the most out of RTX Minecraft, looking at the um, the loading screens, although admittedly this is not due to come out until 2021. I think they actually said 2022. Possibly 2022. And either way, yeah, it's not going it's, to be released in the out. next year. So there's probably a lot of optimization to do here. I'm just testing different colors being thrown down here and watching them blend. And then I accidentally fell into a hole of uh, stuff underneath. So go and have a look at that. But there's still probably a lot of optimization to do, but the loading times on this were excessive. While it played perfectly smooth once it was actually loaded in, it did take quite some time to get running and obviously wanted a fairly beefy system to handle the back end. So... I don't see people buying, you know, a high-end, a Ryzen or you know, i9 gaming rig with a, a two thousand dollar RTX card to play Minecraft when they can just play Minecraft, and or they can run shaders and get yeah, a, 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 uh, what would say a similar effect. A, a they get an effect that is equally as pr- Different. Yeah, it's as a demonstration piece for how the technology works, it is a wonderful build. Beyond a demonstration piece or something for those that have spent money on the RTX cards, I don't see this making a, a much of a major impact. You can see a good example of the RTX down here right on the edges where all the different colors that are on the walls are actually blending together in real time. That's not placed. 
and I tried to break it by putting some color boxes up just to see whether or not I could break that blending, and it just real-time blended. Although I did notice it took a few seconds down here for that to pop in, so it may have taken a little bit for the calculations to actually sort themselves out. Um, and I spotted that in a couple of spots, actually. But overall, it was impressive. But what I really liked and really sort of sold me on RTX, I will say this right now, I am sold on RTX at this point. And it was this section down at the end. I'll, I'll actually qualify that. You're not sold on RTX? Sold well, on sold on ray tracing. Yes, very much so. Um, uh, well, so, well, this is the room. One, one moment. Yep. Um, and let them watch the bit just to get an idea. Then, then tell them what's happening. Okay, so one one thing that I was talking to them about, and they didn't seem as miffed about me asking about it, was I, I pointed out that things like Hairworks is a very proprietary thing to work on competitor cards. Very, um, you know, very closed and whatnot. So they they were very adamant to say that no the RTX or the sorry the DXR the DirectX ray trace is available to anyone so Intel or or AMD can go to town with that and um, so it it is coming to the the competitor cards. Um, Probably in the next generation of of AMD cards, you'll start getting hardware ray tracing. Yeah. So as you can see in the background footage here at the moment, and I'm sure some of you have already clicked on exactly what you're seeing. This is a hall of mirrors. All the box when they're in RTX mode, RTX on, which is that's a bit of a meme, are actually polished mirror with a very light texture on them, so you can tell which ones are blocks and which ones aren't if you know what you're looking. For. The only thing not being reflected inside of the room is you. This room can be made to look like it runs almost endlessly just by placing the blocks in the right position, despite only being maybe 10 metres, 15 metres long and maybe 10 metres wide. Being a relatively small room can may be made to look like nearly unlimited corridors running in any direction. This can almost not be done the way games are currently rendered. I've seen it tried and it always fails because there are... You've spent a bit of time around games, most of you have. You'll notice, you, you guys know, there are tricks with darkness and light and you can always spot when something's being rendered and being coloured up, or covered up rather. Stuff stands out. And so you can always find your way through any type of maze that's built in this sort of a way. In RTX, if you took the textures off the blocks on the walls you would have no way of knowing exactly where the walls ended. You could create a functional room of uh, a, a functional mirror level that you would have to navigate where you wouldn't actually be able to tell where the walls were and what was actually something moving on. This is what sold me on ray tracing as an option, not because it makes things prettier. There's a whole bunch of things you can add to games to make them prettier. But RTX, or ray tracing in particular, actually opens up some really interesting possibilities in regards to puzzle building and world creation. Being able to create things that can't be done in traditional rendering that would actually enhance gameplay or open up entirely new gameplay loops that have never been done before. So speaking of gameplay and world building... Cyberpunk. Oh yes, 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 yes. All right, let's let's jump into that one now. Well, we haven't got any video that we can show you for that one because unfortunately we weren't able to uh, able to record the live gameplay for Cyberpunk. However, um, well, well, before you get too far into it, I, I want to explain how I've been dealing with Cyberpunk. Okay, I, I'm going. I am one hundred going to be buying it. And it on day one that just to be very very clear it's, i'm i was sold on it before I'd, but i've been purposefully avoiding any gameplay videos any any anything that will even give me an impression of what i'm going to be in i had no um, idea I, I i was purposefully avoiding it now I, i'd seen the e3 trailer 
I, I knew sort of what to expect there. It, it was, yeah, you know, it, it was basically an animated cinematic there. It, at least I thought it wasn't very representative of actual gameplay. That it was just a, a pretty demonstration thing that they put up yep. for E3 and what. I watched the gameplay. I, 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 my mind's changed on my opinion on the E3 trailer. That is not too far off actual gameplay. It's, it's sort of like the, the sort of cutscenes from within Witcher 3, for example, where it's all in game engine and it's all, it, it's not pretty up, it's just scripted. That, that's the impression I have of the E3 trailer. The, the depth and possibilities of the game is, well, I've, I've lost count of the, the number of hours I've got sunk into the 3 I'm, I'm six or seven playthroughs through. Um, it, it was, yeah, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to losing my life to this game. <laughs> Um, it's, it's... So there's the impression of somebody who hasn't watched a single thing about cyberpunk outside of the very to be clear when you're talking about the E3 trailer you're talking about the first E3 trailer I'm talking about the your um, your breathtaking ah, no, your okay. breathtaking the, the Keanu Reeves okay, that part. That, that's, that's the only one that I've I've watched I may have seen parts of the the pre- first one uh, I've seen tiny bits of that one where they showed a gameplay video, but I sort of was on in the background. I wasn't actually watching. Yeah. I was kind of half listened to it. I was doing. Okay. I don't. All right. So from my side, um, the gameplay that they had at PAX 2019 or PAX Oz 2019, rather, um. It is one of the gameplay sections that we've seen before at other conventions. I think it was may have been the same one they showed at Gamescom when they're um, going through doing the doing the mission for the Voodoo Boys. Now, I don't, however, think we've seen all of that in one cut, one uncut piece. This was apparently, according to them, if they weren't blowing smoke up our ass, and I don't think they were, the biggest live presentation that they've ever done. And this was by virtue of the fact that they had the main theatre at the Melbourne Exhibition Centre packed to the point that the people were standing in the back section of it in order to actually fit in. It was huge. So I don't think they've just simply had an area that large to be able to do the presentation. And it was played live on stage. Judah and the guy that was actually playing the game was sitting in the front row right next to the presenter who was doing the narration for it. So we could actually... No, he wasn't in the front row. He was on the well, stage. On the stage, on, but, on, like, right up against the front of it. So They actually had a technical issue where the performance, how it should have been. They actually... Well, yeah, while had to while stop we it. Watching, they, 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 they stopped it, brought up the screen, and restarted the game. Yeah, did a, did a restart of it so they could actually get the presentation going again because it was running a bit jittery, which is perfectly fine. Live gameplay presentation... You sort of want that to happen, because if that's not happening, is it really a real gameplay presentation? But anyway, so they had that, and they played through. Now, I remember the entire first section, the mission for the Voodoo Boys, and I remember the second section after that mission. There's a couple of pieces in the middle that I don't think I've seen before. It could be that they were just edited out of the highlight clips. It could be that they've just never been shown. They did show the jump back and forth between different builds. So, for example, they showed a Netrunner build, which is essentially a stealthy hacking build with the ability to remote hack and manipulate items. And they showed a essentially a, a soldier, front runner, heavy solo build. So lots of combat abilities, lots of upfront battle. And they jumped, they replayed a section of the mission. They would play a section of the mission as one character. Then they would jump back to the start of that section of the mission and play it through again as the other character. So you could see how the two different paths functioned. Again, I've seen this done before, but what caught me is that they had, because obviously they were actually playing it live, which was good to see, they did things slightly differently 
on how they'd gone through different playthroughs and manipulated different things. So I got to see a little bit of a different look at how the Netrunner's abilities would work as opposed to the, the, the upfront soldiers and a few extra tricks. Like, for example, the soldier ripped the gun off the mount and used it to kill everybody else in the room um, in, in one uh, section. I, I, will, I will point out that the presenter and the person playing the game, they, they both had fantastic stage presence yep. and and personality so the the presenter sort of narrating what was happening she she was uh, a british british i she she mentioned that she, i don't know whether it was just part of a joke or whether she actually was yeah but she mentioned a being a YouTuber, youtuber for a number of years apparently yeah so and you know she certainly had stage presence in the uh jassic i think yeah. it was the the person actually playing the game he um he, he he liked to make sure things were dead when he killed Yes, them. And, and they were playing yeah. off one another quite a bit. Um, for example, they ran through a sequence where they used the Netrunner abilities to get a bunch of the bad guys to essentially commit suicide. They hacked their limbs, took control of them, and had them shoot themselves in the head rather than them having to yeah, do it. One, As one, just an one, one, of them, one of them, they made him hold on to the hand grenade and yeah, let the hand grenade blow yeah, himself Yeah, pulled up. the pin on his own hand grenade as he was running into the room to blow himself and somebody else up and then got the guy behind him to shoot himself in the head just to show one side of actions why the other side showed the more direct combat route. But it was what was good, even though it wasn't an entirely new gameplay section, it was something that I had seen before, is because it was being played live and it was being done in a slightly different way, it did show that all of the previous gameplay sections that I've ever seen weren't on rails. They were legitimately uh, legitimate playthroughs. I know I have seen some people going that uh, no, we think these are on rails. We don't think these are actually being played at all. No, I've seen that played live now, and it was not played the same as the times I've seen it played before. This was not on rails. And I've seen the mess-ups in the middle where they had to do a reset and where the the person who was doing the commentary on stage made a smart-ass comment, so the guy playing the game decided to act up on that smart-ass comment to do something to trigger a bit of a laugh from the crowd or vice versa. It's not that the gameplay is as you see it in those videos, at least as it is at the moment, whether or not that's what it will be on release, but what they're showing you in the videos at this point in time is not bullshit. It's exactly what they're claiming it is. Speaking of bullshit, that, that segues into our final topic of the, of the podcast. Blizzard. All right. Yes. So right, let's do this one. Um, I wasn't actually sure I wasn't going to cover into this because first podcast and going straight into the negative crap, but I'm going to have to cut over myself right here. So this bit here has been recorded in post and I'm overlapping my, I guess, final rant of this podcast because this was recorded incredibly late at night after a very long weekend. And quite frankly, I didn't come across as clear as I would have liked. Now, I'm not trying to hide any of this. If you want to see the original rant, it's up on Twitch. Go check it out. Blizzard. All right. So the reason why I wanted to put this up at the end of the podcast is because while we were at PAX, Blizzard did have a stand. And there were people manning it. It wasn't much of one. Well, Classic's the only thing they've had to release. And it was basically a, a wall with a poster on it for WoW Classic and a couple of um, prop weapons floating around for people to go up and have photos taken against. It wasn't a great deal of anything. But a couple of times when we walked past there, there was a few snide comments being thrown around in regards to recent things that Blizzard has been doing. Now, that pissed me off a little bit because it's actually highly unlikely that the people that were manning this stand were actually Blizzard employees. They were more than anything, they were likely just local contractors that were hired to put on a Blizzard shirt and help people take photographs against his stand, and that's about it. They probably didn't even know about any of the events regarding the, the banning of the player for putting up the statement about Hong Kong and any of the political backlash and public backlash and internet backlash that's actually occurred as a result of that. And yet, it's also highly unlikely that they went the entire three days manning that booth without hearing some of the uh, rather nasty comments aimed at them for the simple fact that they were wearing a shirt. To be clear, nobody was directly going up to them, but... If I could hear the comments, they heard at least some of them. 
Now, back in the day uh, when I was a lot younger, I was taught some rules of business, um, unofficial rules of business. I believe it was my uncle that actually taught me to them. And one of them, one of the more important ones was that you never bring politics into a business because any business is built up on your employees and it is also built up on your customers and your employees will have their own political beliefs and your customers will have their own political beliefs. And if you bring politics into your business, you're going to splinter your employees and you're going to splinter your customers and no business can afford to do that. No matter what situation occurs following that, the business is always going to be the bad guy. Most businesses seem to know this inherently and so they go out of their way to stay out of politics as much as they possibly can. For some stupid reason, Blizzard has decided to step straight into the centre of some pretty nasty politics. And we are seeing an example of that rule basically being played out live now. Uh, as I understand it, what's been announced so far, a large number of Blizzard employees have outrightly quit. I'm expecting to see more of that happen. I expect that the, those that were most outraged probably quit immediately. There are probably others that are planning to go at this point in time that are currently looking for work before they leave. But I expect to hear about a second wave of employees quitting the company. You've got a whole bunch of players that are trying to not only just stop giving Blizzard money, so cancelling subscriptions and so on for things like World of Warcraft, but are actively trying to close their accounts, which includes deleting the products on their accounts, to the point where either the system overloaded and bugged out, preventing people from closing their accounts, or Blizzard deliberately broke the system that allowed for accounts to be closed in order to try and stop people from doing it and try and keep people on board until they could get their PR out, which hasn't actually worked. Their PRs turned out to be absolutely terrible. But in either case, it doesn't really matter which one of those situations is accurate at this point in time. It's not a good look in either way, and also, as a result, low-level employees of Blizzard, or people that are associated with Blizzard, that are not completely uninvolved in the decisions that the company has been making, are copying at least light levels of harassment as a result of simple association. Sadly, Blizzard isn't the only company that I've seen that uh, has been getting involved in politics in some level or another recently. And I'm probably preaching to the choir a little bit here, but it needs to stop. So, the core of how all of this happened, obviously, was a player at a tournament made a stance on Hong Kong, and Blizzard decided to punish him for it and stand in defense of China. That was the basic reasoning for all of this happening. Let's assume for a second, however, that Blizzard chose not to do that. They chose not to get involved in the politics. What would have happened? Well, a player at a Blizzard tournament would have made a statement on Hong Kong. The media and the parts of the internet that agreed with the statement would have paraded the player for being brave and making a stance. The media and sections of the internet that disagreed with the statement would have complained, of course, and the entire thing would have blown over in about the space of a week, because that's about as long as the internet and the media can actually keep any kind of concentration on any one comment or any one subject, unless something causes it to blow up and be significantly larger. This whole thing would have been a total non-event, uh, just a small, minor, and easily forgotten piece of news if all Blizzard had done is shut the fuck up and remember that they are an entertainment company, that their sole reason for existing is to make games to entertain their consumers, and that their consumers do not give the slightest shit about their political stance on anything, so long as they're making decent games. Instead, they chose to get political, and now they're losing employees, they're losing consumers, they've lost public trust, and things aren't looking to turn around for them anytime soon. And I think, more than anything else, Blizzard should be a lesson to other entertainment companies at the moment, because they're not the only ones that have been getting their nose stuck into politics recently, and I think it's about time entertainment companies had a little bit of a wake-up call. I think it's about time they realised that... They are just entertainment companies. Nobody cares about their politics. Nobody cares what their stance is. 
We care whether or not they are capable of producing a product that will entertain us and allow us a bit of escapism from the stupid politics that we have to deal with on a day-to-day basis. Beyond that, we don't care. And by getting involved in real-world politics, all you're going to do is piss a lot of people off very, very quickly. And, unfortunately, the core reason for actually starting off this whole rant, get a lot of people harassed that had nothing to do with it. Anyways, guys, I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sorry about the little edit here at the end, but I felt that it was really important to try and get this out clear, um, because... Yeah, well, as I said, I was going to avoid everything in regards to Blizzard. In fact, as this in this podcast in general, we want to avoid most of these negative subjects unless there's something incredibly important, as much as we possibly can. But um, we were seeing some of the results of Blizzard's stupid, mis- uh, stupid decisions recently being played out live right in front of us while we were at PAX, and it was really getting on my nerves. It was really a bit of shit, so... Um, I really wanted to address that, and I really wanted to make it clear, and I didn't want to have my ruined, exhausted brain manage to ruin what I was trying to say, and I felt that it sort of was in the podcast. So, quick re-record on that here, just to get it out clear, and yeah, I hope it makes more sense now. Basically, gaming companies stay the fuck out of politics, just don't get involved in politics, simple as that. Um, so beyond that, um, for the most part, as I sort of mentioned, we are going to be trying to avoid the more negative subjects. There's plenty of places you can pick up people that are chasing the negative parts of the gaming culture at the moment. I want to focus on sort of the more interesting positive sides that are coming up. Um, hopefully we'll get a few of those. Um, um, we'll be following a lot of the flight simulation side of stuff, obviously, uh, as news comes in, this one was mostly based around PAX, because PAX, um, as well as some mostly around the wargaming side of stuff as well, although we will have other games come in because we do play other stuff. Uh, as was mentioned at the start, the podcasts are going to go for roughly an hour to an hour and a half, give or take, we don't want to go much further than that. And the last thing, Dead Meat put a request at the end of the podcast, which I'm going to put here as well. If you have any questions or any topics that you would like to discuss, put them in the comment section down below, and we will go through them. I won't guarantee that we will get to them, but if we can, we'll try and pop some of them in to address them as well. I'm still not 100% sure on the structure. This won't be the final structure, same as this will not be the final date of the podcast as well, because... We did this on the Saturday because we were at PAX on Saturday. It's likely to be a weekday podcast at some point in the future. And as mentioned at the start, it's going to be fortnightly for a start. If there's a bit of popularity going to it, it will probably drop down to weekly. And if it does get popular enough, what I'm actually going to do in a year's time from now, when we're at PAX 2020, because Dead Meat and I will be going to PAX 2020 again, we'll actually book out a streaming space on the floor so we can live stream the podcast directly from the ground floor in packs with live footage on the spot of the actual venue running while we're there. So that's the goal, but we'll see exactly how it goes between now and then. Anyways, guys, hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching the first podcast. The next one will be in a fortnight. Until then, take care.